where yeah. it's working. And I can't wait to see where it's going to be going when the hot if I do the hot spot and it works. You're telling me that it's, it's uh, Comcast is beaming me through uh, Indiana, and that's why everybody's <clears> that's normal. Yeah. This problem of slow and no connection. Place. Well, that's the way they all are. When you go through the phone network, you come out in another state. That's where they're. That's where the uh, the interface between uh, the phone network and the uh, IP yeah. network is. Okay. So that's that's normal. Yeah. This is for B. Uh, and <laughs> it's an act of Congress to make it so you can sign checks and stuff. It was about 1998, so when, they, when Congress said, okay, you must be able to. I want to, but why can't you send your check as a fact? What's the problem here? It would only get processed once. And they wouldn't let me do it until Congress said, you have to buy the computer. By this time, I was a dot com failure. Yeah, so I, it's impressive stock market news this week. Um, just today, 500 so points. Down. Yes, the stock market has lost all its gains for this year. Oh, um, no, they yeah, don't. High tech went down and nobody really knows why, I think. Um, Yeah, you would expect the uh, the Chinese thing to have an effect eventually. Um, this one is, uh, was pretty interesting. Yahoo paying fifty million because they lost everybody's data. Anybody? Is that new news? No, I think that was a long time ago. Okay. But uh, this one here, um, this I I'm heard this. If you have apps, these companies will offer you money to buy the app, and they did. They will also, if you have a browser extension, it's popular. A company will buy it, and in both cases, they'll then use it to put malware on. And this was going on affecting 120 million people or something. Um, they bought the Android apps and then pushed malware through it, which would steal the data from the phone and track the people. So um, Google finally caught on to this one and blocked it. But this is the 50th time that they've had problems in the store and Google finds it. There is tons of malware in the Google App Store. This is why Android is very, very unsafe compared to iPhone. There's almost no malware in the iPhone store and the Google store is all full of malware because they're open source and they don't have much defense. Anyway, um, let's see if there's anything else exciting. Uh, student, student guest, I think it's easy, good one to get on to. Uh, yes. guest. Yeah, there's a guest network, yeah, yeah. Okay. Testing, student. testing, all right. Anyway, the... Um, I have them, I just want to get on now. Yeah, now this one is interesting and appropriate for this class. I was looking for this one. So in your projects here, see one thing we talk about quite a bit in this DNS class is DNS privacy, because that is one of the big issues for real users. And the DNS officials have given us nothing. As you'll see, the official things that exist are DNS curve and DNS crypt, and they don't work at all, not really worth a damn. And so what's happened now is the thing that's mm -hmm. actually taken off is DNS over HTTPS which everybody can understand, there's already encrypted, and now that has become an internet engineering standard. It's now an RFC. So this is now a official standard ava available to be used on the internet, and now that that has happened, then um, Paul Vixie, who is the guy that, I think he's got to go by, he's really important in the world of DNS, said, you can't do that, that doesn't make any sense. Which of course it doesn't, because DNS is needed for name resolution to get up to layer three, and HTTPS runs at layer seven. So if HTTPS was the source of your DNS, you'd never be able to find the server to make the HTTPS connection. It kind of makes no sense at all. He's kind of right, but we're all using it. It works in practice, and all the people selling it say, well, you know, this same thing happened with Wi-Fi. There was WEP that totally didn't work, and the Internet Engineering Task Force did nothing for 10 years, so manufacturers made up this horrible thing called WPA, that did not obey any of the official best practices. But they said, you give us nothing, we'll make our own garbage and use that. And that's what's happening. Anyway, so this is very common. That, you know, because I mean, real consumers are out there and real companies are out there. And if the Internet Engineering Task Force doesn't cough up a standard, they will just make something that's not a standard and sell it because people need it. So we're going to have GNS over HTTPS, even though it is mathematically messed up. So that means yeah. that you can't get in the first place, you couldn't get your information. I know, you I know. Your information to get the DNS yeah, so I think what it means is you have to use an insecure lookup to make the HTTPS connection. Wasn't the point of the DNS server to make it simple to find each other in the first place? Well, uh, 
I think it was just to make it work at all. And um, okay, they weren't but, trying to make it simple. They were trying to make it work. Well, okay. which of course involved making it simple in the early days. Backwards. And uh, and you know from this you know it's like everything else, there were many. The internet changed so many times that all the rules changed underneath them. But anyway, so we're up to I think chapter four. So you have to have a good connection to be able to get the DNS resolution. Well, that that is something also that they wouldn't like is that um, DNS was designed to run over uh, UDP so that you wouldn't need a very good connection for it. And now you need a better one. But you know, in the modern world, everybody has HTTPS. And this is what often happens. All the considerations involved in designing the protocol have become irrelevant because of, of the changes in the technology. But anyway, apparently we're going to DNS or HTTPS. Uh, Burp has been using it for about a year. Many products use it, and I think it's going to become the standard, and I'm always all for that because in practice, it works a lot better, and HTTPS has an established way of distributing the keys and everything, and all these alternative systems have really archaic, clunky ways to distribute keys because they were defined long ago before HTTPS came. And so, however, logically, it makes no sense at all to move layer three over layer seven. He's kind of got a point, but in practice, that's what we're doing. <laughs> anyway, so um, then we got to talk about breaches. Now, there used to be a... Um, philosophy, which was popular until maybe five years ago, that you would have security barriers and you would then have a thing called a trusted network. So you would have uh, laptops installed by IT controlled with antivirus on them and a domain controller and you'd have cables and ethernet ports and lock down the MAC addresses and you wouldn't let people bring in devices from home and you'd trust that network to be all clean and only good people. And of course in the modern world this is utterly hopeless because people bring in their phone and their laptop and their USB stick and everything all full of malware from home. And as they surf the web and read email, their devices get infected because your firewalls and antivirus do not stop everything. So now we've moved to the zero trust model, which is realistic, which is where everything is probably infected and you just use it anyway. By the way, I was, I was configuring some more projects on my server and I noticed this morning about six that my server got hacked last night. Somebody got root on my server and they changed a few system files. And this happens all the time because it's my attack server. There are known vulnerabilities. It's not that hard to get root. You'll get extra credit if you do it. And um, they didn't do enormous damage. And I just found what they did. They made a new backdoor account, which I deleted. Uh, they changed some of the system. They deleted the, the way I caught them is they changed the bash history to point to dev random. And I had a script that would make a copy of the history. So I'd see what had happened. And that hung up now because it would copy endless stream of random junk. So uh, I wondered, why is my script hanging up? It took me all like, why is the history going to dev random? I've been rooted. And that was like six hours ago. So I, then I queried for all the changes made in that hour, which is pretty easy and really didn't do very much. Changed two or three system files. I changed the shutdown command to execute dev random for some reason. But anyway, I, I changed those things back, deleted the extra account they made, changed the password and just carry on. And that's the way people do it now. You can't make things too clean. You're never gonna have it really clean. Now, if you get an infected server, you typically restore it from an image-based backup, but you never really trust it completely. Yeah. Dev random just is an endless stream of random numbers. I don't know, dev zero is just zeros and dev random is just a device in Unix that pumps out random junk. Out random yep, forever. Yeah, I don't know why they have it, but it's, it's there in case you need to let you know something happened. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, they didn't actually hurt it much. But anyway, so um, so anyway, now that now that you've accepted that you probably got bad things happening on your network that you cannot prevent entirely, you now have to have defense in depth, where you have whatever defenses you can have, and then you have monitoring to see what got through and a response team to deal with what got through. So here's the four kinds of data. The log data is the most obvious. Everything has logs, server logs, DNS logs, firewall logs, and that's they're there for exactly this reason to diagnose problems, uh, often not security problems, but performance problems. And then you can have network flow data, which gives you a summary of network traffic. This many bytes going here, this many bytes going here, and that, but without storing the entire packets. And then there's packet data, which is the most clumsy and big, but the most accurate, of course, where you save the entire packets, like you might out of Wireshark. This is, of course, the most complete information, but it also means far too much data to store for any length of time and far too much data to dig through to analyze. So you normally only use packet data for a narrowly focused measurement of something. And then there's application level metadata, which kind of in between, which we'll see. Um, so logs are the simplest. 
Um, you can look for uh, queries and answers and see if people are sending uh, badly formatted queries or if your server is somehow not performing correctly. Um, you can have lame delegations. You can have situations where your DNS server says, go ask some other server, but that other server is not really replying because something's wrong. And then you, this is what happens, I think, to students all the time at the college. You go to someone and say, I have a problem. They say, go ask someone else. When you go there, they don't help you either. And you just are abandoned. And this happens, of course, among servers. And you can also do queries for non-existent domains. And these may not resolve in any reasonable amount of time. So you can turn in the login. Um, by default, I don't think bind logs anything. But you can turn on the logs because bind is very, very much designed for maximum speed because it dates from a really long time ago when the networks were slow and the processor was slow and the hardware was weak and you had to squeeze every bit of performance out of it. So you can turn on various levels of warning. And so the channel tells you where to send the logs. Uh, typically on Linux, you put it in syslog, which goes to a system process that stores them in a system log, but you could also put them somewhere else. Um, you can specify um, how big the files will get before they roll over. This is something important with logging. You can't just let the logs grow and grow and grow until they fill the hard disk and crash the drive. You have to make them roll around and keep the maximum size. And then severity. You could log everything or you could log just the most severe end or various things in between. And you can control what's printed about each thing. So if you log the queries, it will then of course log what the client asked for and their IP and the question they asked. And uh, that is something you might want to do because you're not going to make much sense out of DNS servers if you don't log the queries. Someone got stuck at work again. Wouldn't the updated TCP, I'm not aware of any update to TCP. Um, wouldn't the server cache have the info already registered? Perhaps you're talking about uh, HTTPS. Yes, and that's the point. But in, in principle, DNS over HTTPS does require you to do a DNS before you have an HTTPS connection. So it kind of depends on having some use of insecure DNS. And that strikes me as the kind of thing that purists don't like, but practical people like. Instead of everything being unencrypted, we'll accept a few queries being unencrypted and the rest being encrypted and call that an improvement. And that's why the purists say, your logic is no good, you're a bum, you shouldn't do this. And other people say, you know, this is better than what we used to have, we'll just carry on. <laughs> that's typically, this is like, you know, there's a, there's a good saying, it's a, in theory, there is no difference between theory and practice, but in practice, there is a difference. Anyway, um, so yeah, you can, yeah, let's see, another quick chat is coming through. Let me see if I can figure out this one. Uh, I'm not too good at picking these other. Wouldn't, Okay, good. Okay, fair enough. All right, so um, all right, so you can see a log indicated here, and it's got an SE at the end, which means this was a signed query and extended DNS, which we talked about before. Remember, DNS by default can only give you 512 bytes of data, which used to be enough, but it is emphatically not enough if you use DNSSEC and you have to put in those big signatures. So if you do use DNSSEC, you typically have to use one of the uh, improvements on DNS and extended DNS is one of the ways to make it bigger that goes up to 4096 bytes over UDP. There are other ways to do it too. There's one that goes over TCP. Then you have a security log. This will show you requests that were denied, requests that were forbidden, attempts to do things you're not allowed to do like a zone transfer, which is usually blocked. And uh, there you go. You have a few options here to have different levels. You can also have access control lists. You can have them more detailed than just blocking zone transfers. You can disallow recursion and so on. And so certain kinds of requests will not be honored. And that would go in the security log. Somebody attempted to do something forbidden. And then there's update security. You have DNS updates. Your DNS server is getting updates from somewhere, typically from the master server or the authority server. And so you can have various policies distributing when it's going to update, whether it updates and records. And this is important if somebody is putting out poison updates and telling lies to your server, which can happen. And then of course, DNSSEC. If you configure your server to use DNSSEC, then it's got DNSSEC validation, and you can have various logs recording the operation of DNSSEC, and you do this in the projects. One of the projects, you configure DNSSEC on your server and make sure the logs show that it is doing DNSSEC. Um, all right, and so this is a part of it. It will show you these DNS, so DNS key starting, attempting response validation, and so on. You'll get a lot of log entries. DNSSEC is like HTTPS, it makes a, you know, the normal TCP handshake is three packets. SYN, SYNAC, ACK, and HTTP HES handshake is seven packets. And they're much bigger because you have to make a TCP connection, then you have to request a certificate, get a certificate, uh, offer 
choose an encryption method, get it approved, transfer a key, and so on. There's quite a few steps of back and forth, and it's the same thing for DNSSEC. That's why the purists don't like it. Encryption is computationally and network bandwidth expensive. Obviously, you have to spend more time setting it up and then more CPU running it once it's up there. But in the modern machines, can do it with no big problem. When Google converted to 100% HTTPS, there was a popular belief at that time that it would be very expensive to do so. And what Google said is, there's cost in doing the transition, of course. Your programmers and network administrators have to do something. But the end result, it was only 1% more CPU time than the other one. So in modern hardware, it really isn't that expensive. But it does make things more complicated. And I think the main reason people avoid it is not the cost of doing it, the cost of running it, but the difficulty of setting it up and the performance problems as it's set up wrong. Your network administrators have to learn how to do it and learn how to debug it. And it's another layer of complexity that will give them a headache. And so people would rather just not bother as long as they can. But now I think with the browser manufacturers putting up error messages, there's a lot of pressure to really move up to HTTPS. And at some point, there may be some pressure to move up to encrypted DNS, although until now, I think there's been none because users have no idea this has happened. They don't know that everything they do is being sent in clear with DNS requests everywhere. They, they're unaware of the problem, so they are not clamoring for the solution. Anyway, you can also have zone transfers. You'll have logs recording that zone transfers came in or out when they're approved. And then you can have packet data. Now, this I'm setting up for this in the lab. The, um, we had a speaker a couple days ago that came in and he has an artificial intelligence machine learning intrusion detection system and I just installed it in Science 214 and I've ordered a network tap. We don't have a network tap and then we're going to start monitoring and we'll have an AI device inspecting the traffic and it should be awesome or maybe not. At least we'll get to see what it does. And this is, this is the way you do it. You take a managed switch and you can configure a span port in software which means it sends an extra copy of every packet out the span port. Uh, they're, they're typically expensive, but I found one on Amazon for like 20 bucks. So God knows what I'm gonna get. Very, li very likely, very likely, but that's what I'm gonna put in the hacking lab, a little five port switch with a span port on it. So we will supposedly get a copy of the packet to monitor and we'll see how well it works. I don't know how much you expect for 20 bucks, but we'll see. Supposedly, it runs a gigabit. So, uh, what's a certain amount of speed per second? Yes. Uh, so uh, where would you put all the data anyway to look at something? Well, that, the data will go into the server, and the server will analyze it. And in fact, this is just the issue we're talking about here. You, once you get all those packets, now what do you do? If you store them all, you're going to fill up all your storage really fast. Right. It's Everybody's something like 81 gigabytes a month. So yeah. typically, typically, people do not store PCAPs for any length of time, maybe like an hour or a day. <laughs> say we're going to do this on purpose and anybody who wants to use it use it well i used to i used to worry about that but in fact um it would really be redundant because everybody's being monitored anyway this like six <laughs> six years ago when the deep packet inspection firewalls came out all the privacy advocates being you guys are doing it, and then we all got used to it like six years ago is when um we're doing it anyway Everybody's doing it. Anyway. Everybody has to do it. Six years ago is when the Palo Alto firewall started coming out with layer seven inspection, and everybody screamed, "You're only supposed to look at the address. You're not supposed to be reading the packets. That's like Google reading the mail. That's horrible." And you bummed. And they screamed and yelled, and then everybody just did it, and they just shut up and got tired of yelling about it. And now everybody does it all the time. For example, the college does. They block BitTorrent. Everybody has to do this because you have to block BitTorrent. If you don't block BitTorrent, not only is your college constantly uh, subject to legal attacks for breaking copyright, but all the bandwidth is used up and people can't get anything done because people are bit-torting all over the place, so everybody has to block it. So and the, the Yeah, bit is file sharing. And the people who do it, they um, love it, and so they have ever-increasing technical improvements, so it'll move to ports, it'll do a port scan to find an open port, so you need a layer seven deep packet inspection firewall that will look inside the packet and recognize that it's a BitTorrent packet no matter how you disguise it, and we have one, and everybody has one. So everybody is watching your traffic these days. There's, if you think otherwise, you're wrong. They're all watching everything. Now they're not reading it all to like target you and find out what you're doing and punish you personally. They're trying to monitor the flow, like the water system. If somebody turns on the water and just leave it run, they try to notice where's all the water going and do something about it. They're just trying to keep the network going primarily, although there are abuses like Comcast kept on blocking certain video services like Netflix, so you pay for the other one. And they kept on blocking BitTorrent when they promised not to and getting caught 
and uh, various nations do political censorship and stuff. So, I mean, there are th people that do things you don't like, but everybody is monitoring your traffic and everybody is shaping your traffic. This is why I suppose I'm sort of like those internet engineering purists. I've never understood net neutrality. Who are you kidding? All networks are monitored, all networks are shaped, certain traffic is blocked, certain traffic is prioritized. They has to be just for performance. So when you're gonna write a net neutrality law, you'd have to be careful writing it because there is no such thing as treating all the traffic equally. That has never been done and it never will be done. You can't do that. You have to block the attacks and you have to high prioritize the real time stuff. So anyway, yeah, that's, that's, there's no neutrality in that power grid. There's no neutrality in the water system. Any system of pipes delivering something, you have to be monitoring it and adjusting it to make it work. Yes, VPNs are a very good move. VPNs will add a layer of encryption to everything on top of whatever else is there, and that makes you safer. Although they typically will not protect you from DNS snooping because almost no VPNs actually move the DNS traffic through the VPN. It's possible to do that, but almost none of the things you install actually do it correctly. There was a study about a year ago that showed 80% of VPNs don't encrypt the DNS traffic. Yeah, but if, if we've set up correctly, a VPN means you've added a layer of encryption to everything, and then what happens is most people block the VPN entirely, like the Great Wall of China, because then they don't know what you're doing. You could be doing whatever we forbid in that VPN, so almost nobody will allow encrypted traffic out through their barrier, because obviously I cannot inspect it. I can't check it for malware, I can't check to see if it's company secrets leaving, or whatever I don't like you're doing, I wanna be able to inspect the packets. Anyway, so, um, a span port gets a copy of the packets on the wire, and then you feed it into some software that'll pick it up using live PCAP or Win PCAP, and you save it as PCAPs. Yeah. Uh, the, um, the AI firewall that you're setting up. Yeah. Um, the, AI, the AI firewall I'm setting up is this one. Let me bring it up. This is very nice. The guy, he gave him come and gave a talk to us, and um, it is open source and free Chiron. This is it from JASC. That's it. This thing is free. It's 20 gigs. I downloaded it last night and got it running. Right now, it's not doing anything because I don't have the span port to feed it in. I just wanted to see if it would run. It does run. Now I need to put in the span port and get, it, get some traffic, and then we'll see what it does. And I guess it will take some time to learn and all that jazz. I don't really quite understand the AI part, but I'll let you know as we progress. We can all get used to it. Uh, I would, it's a very good question. I would think you would have to, but I think what he says is it does crowdsourced learning. All the people are contributing the information, something like that. So um, that, well, apparently some of them are, and I wonder about all that. And there may be privacy concerns. A lot of things might be happening. So that's why I want to get in the game and we can all start learning this, this brave new world. Um, there's certainly a Yes, I know that, but most most products do this sharing. Your antivirus typically sends stuff back. Your Windows 10 sends stuff back to Microsoft. The, everybody's got onto this crowdsourcing thing. Uh, and and they typically they make it difficult or impossible to turn that off because the whole performance relies on getting all that data. So privacy, um, I, I got the book called The Puzzle Palace. I highly recommend it. It's the history of the NSA. It goes back far longer than I thought. And around 1910, this started, and the NSA and its earlier incarnations have always been illegally harvesting telegrams, radio, and everything. And every couple, of, every couple of presidents, somebody gets mad and says, this is illegal. They say, oh, we'll quit. And then they just hide it and keep doing it because they have to do it. This is a, I mean, one of my students wanted to get a job at the CIA, and he said, that will put me above the law. And this is not politically correct, but it's, of course, true. They are above the law. They kill people. They steal stuff. They break all the laws. They break the privacy laws. They just murdered people. I mean, that's, that's what you have a black ops military that breaks the law. That's how it works. I told me I could come right from Langley. I want, there's no outside offices. I want the job down there. Everybody. Yeah. Yeah, you got to be over there. because Anyway, so. This is a base office. Come on yeah. Down, sign in. Yeah, yeah. Anyways, then there's network flow data. Now, network flow data was intended to meter the traffic so you can charge for it. 
this is the idea. So, for example, Comcast. I mean, I don't know what it is now, but when I started, you got 10 megabits per second, and they had to pay more for like 50. And, of course, the pipe they put in can handle much more, and it goes all the traffic for your whole neighborhood, but they have a throttle to limit you to 10 until you pay more. And that's what this does. So they monitor the flow. The theoretical product is NetFlow. It was the Cisco product. It is the industry standard. And it became the protocol that even non-Cisco products use, I think, now standardized as an official IETF standard. And that's just a way to record how many packets went from here to there at what time. It doesn't keep the packets. It just stores an entry. And it's based on the really old AAA systems from the phone network, which would just say who you called and how long the call was so we can bill you. It didn't record what you said, just how much you had used of the resources so they could put it on the bill. That's called pen register data. And so it exports the flow as soon as the session ends. Now TCP sessions have a very clear session. They start with SYN, ACK, and ACK, and then they end with a reset or a FIN under normal conditions so you know right where they start and where they end. So you can record that as one TCP flow. They connected to this server at this time and they sent this many bytes. But UDP doesn't have any handshake, so you really don't know. When the flow ends, so you just have to sort of guess. While the traffic is flowing, you call it a continuous gap of like five seconds. You say, well, I guess that's the end of that one. And when they start sending data again, you call it a new flow. It's just an arbitrary cut. So a real UDP session may appear as several flows in the log because the device can't really tell. And so uh, long sessions might break up into several. And so you'll see data like this. You know, router one, one I source to destination, IP address, and then information about how many bytes and the timestamps of when it started, and so on, just what you'd think. Uh, this is what all log entries look like, just a line of text. Unfortunately, every product makes their own arbitrary decision of how to format this, how to make the date, what order to put it in. And when you get to a SIM product like Splunk, that's its problem, which is just the same problem Google has. You want to index the internet, and yet there is no standardization. Everybody just puts information all over their website, however they like, and you have to somehow find it and index it anyway, that people now do that, and your SIM does the same thing. It tries to take all these logs that are not the same and somehow figure out how to help you search through that junk anyway. And what is the SIM? SIM is SIEM, Security Information Event Manager. Splunk is the king here, but there are many other products like Elk, and uh, everybody has to have one. Once you get these logs, you then have logs on many servers, and you have many different kinds of logs on every server and router and firewall and switches and you to find out if you're under attack you have to get it all in one place so you put agents on everything that sends to a central point and the central point has all the data and now you need some kind of engine to search through this thousands of lines of junk coming in and Splunk is one of the competitors there another big one is QRadar that is IBM's QRadar will take your data summarize it send it over the internet to Watson which is the IBM AI that won Jeopardy and watch and we'll figure out what your attacks are. And I've seen it run, it's very nice. It pops up an alert that tells you exactly who attacked you and what the attack was. It's really smart, as you would think, but it cost a million bucks. Now they put out a free version a year ago, so I've eagerly downloaded the free version and you can run it in a VM and it doesn't work at all. It's horrible. You, and you said, well, you have to put it on a million dollar IBM server, but the software is free. And I said, well, you know, your idea of free and my idea of free are not quite the same, but. Splunk is very expensive. Splunk, you can use it to train for, because you're limited to like 500 megabytes a day of log data, which is not enough for anything more than your home network. And after that, you pay thousands of dollars a year to get enough. If you want something free, use Elk. Elk is the open source. It's completely open source, runs on Linux, and it is very, very difficult to set up and very difficult to use. And the, the main purpose of Elk is to convince you to go pay for Splunk in my experience. But this AI thing that I got here is running Elk, and he's already installed it and configured it. You just download the VM and run it, and it's working pretty well. That's the way to do it. Installing it yourself will make you cry. Yeah. Yeah. But Chiron's still in like an early beta, so it's not, but it is free to some extent. I think it's gonna have a pay version too. Anyway, so um, yeah, sure, this is good stuff. So then we have metadata. So the flow records give you very little. You connected to that server and sent this much data, but I don't really don't know if that was malware or email or what it was. I might want something a little more, something between flow records and packet data. So application layer metadata stores carefully chosen summary information, like you might store the information about DNS. 
what the record was, how many responses. So I can tell if, if this person has asked for this DNS information many times. If they have, that's probably something screwy like an attack. And that's a little bit more data than just the DNS log. All right. So let's try some cahoots. I've got them someplace. Um, we are looking for 40, chapter 4A, and it should be my, my favorites. Yeah, there we are, 4A. Okay. And you have a glorious Halloween cahoot music. And I should get a text document ready to store the winners. Oh. Oh, that's pretty cute. There's a flower behind the ear. I like that one. All right. Now, I'll wait a few more seconds and see if we got more takers. All right. I think that's about it. Okay. So. Okay, what data uses the IP fix standard? IP fix, I guess. But those are the flows, that is Cisco's net flow. That is the official standard. All right. So what data is controlled by named.com? Name D is probably the way to say it. All right, name D.com is the bind config file. Name D is the name of the daemon that runs to run DNS, and that's how you configure your login. What do you get at a span port? Actually, no. Now, you get the raw packets there, and this is interesting. You said everything. It's not everything. For example, the logs, the logs have information that's actually not in the packets. Like you made a request that was denied. That's not, yeah, yeah, yeah that's other kind of data. So actually, it's interesting. My first thought, of course, is the packets have everything and the logs have less, but it's not that simple. The logs have, yeah, the logs have different information. Anyway, so, um, all right, so what log entry shows you that someone collected your bind data with a zone transfer? That's X for out. It is going out of your server to somebody else. And what kind of data protects the privacy of your users by excluding IP addresses? Missing a C and excluding. I think it's the application level metadata that tends to do that, yeah. All right, so let me record the winners. I've got DeFace, Eli, W, and Peter D. DeFace is one of you guys? Yeah. Steven, right, good, okay, good. All right, and good, we got time to just carry on here. So, 
All right, so then we can talk about detection. Um, there are different kinds of attacks, and you would like to detect them, so there are going to be certain patterns of information here. So if somebody's trying to guess the transaction ID and source port to send a false update to your server, then you'll see a request for a record, and then a that is not cached, so it will have to look up the answer, and then an attempt to spit out the answer really fast, so my answer will replace the real answer from the other server it's asking. So that's a pattern of data you'll see. Um, all right. And so you can spot it by doing a query that looks for um, source or destination port of 53 and source or destination of the IP server. And that shows you DNS requests in and out of your server. And you can look for the pattern of one request followed by many responses, like you'll see here. Um, all right. Uh, your flow records have no layer seven data. They do not see the DNS request, so you don't know what it was asking for. That would might perhaps be helpful. Uh, you cannot find the address. If they do successfully poison your cache, you will not find what they fed in, which would help because then you'd know what their command and control center is for their botnet and that sort of thing. But, you know, that's what you get for having high-level data. You're missing the details. You can only answer certain questions. Um, so you have to figure out your relevant data. Poisoning is performed by replies. The original query was not relevant. That was just to get the server to ask a question. So what you need is the reply data, and you could use a lot of information about the replies here to help you understand the attack. Um, there are transient domains out there also. This is what bad guys do a lot. When you start using a domain for some malicious purpose, like as a command and control center or to spit out spam, you will get caught before long from people who do this monitoring. They'll find you, they will report you to their, their uh, ISP. This machine is being used to do something evil. Now you can pay for bulletproof hosting. There are companies typically in other countries that advertise that they will never take you down. You can put anything horrible on here you want, child pornography, malware, crime, they will never take you down and you pay extra money for that. And that's called bulletproof hosting. But most criminals are too cheap to pay for that. So they hack a server and use it for a while and then they have to jump to another server as they keep getting shut down. And so they make these transient domains that keep moving from one physical server to another. So you um, have your botnet stays up, even though people keep taking down the command and control center, you just hop to another one. So um, if you want to identify the use of transient domains, you can watch for short TTLs. Remember, TTL is the time it lives in the cache, and typically that's hours or days. But for these bad guys, it might be just a few seconds because they are changing the IP frequently, which is not something a normal company would do. You have hosting, you leave the same server there for years, but the bad guy wants to hop every few minutes so you can't figure out who it is and shut them down. So um, there's also round robin DNS. We've seen that before. Um, let's take, a, I'll bring it up again here because that was kind of fun. Microsoft was using this the last time I did this. Let me see which it's still using this. So let me make my. Uh, we can come back to them anyway. Yeah, they're really important. Um, all right. Okay. All right, so here we are. Oh, I don't know. Um, not that much lately. But that's what I thought. I thought if I dig Microsoft.com, I get many A records. And if I just dig them again, I should get them in a different order at randomly. Let's see, 41, 13, 201, 201, maybe not. But notice the TTL, 1296, 1293. There's the TTL counting down. And they're all synchronized. This makes me think I'm looking at a content distribution system. I'm seeing a image of this stuff on one server. Let's try getting a different server, like 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8. Each DNS server farm has their own way of doing this. So these guys, they're all synchronized again, but now it's round robining. Google is round robining properly. It was 13 on top, now it's 104 on top, now it's 40 on top. This is a simple form of load balancing. You put a different one on top for each query, so traffic will go to all of your different servers equally. And that will get, so that's a simple one way to do load balancing. Another way, which is probably also happening, is that that IP address is not going to a server. It's going to a hardware load balancer, and that is then distributing among many machines, which I can't see. That's commonly what you do. Anyway, um, all right, so uh, yeah, here's what I saw before, same kind of thing. And you notice the TTL counting down as there will come a time when it then has, when it hits zero, this number counting down, it will erase the cache, and the next query will cause it to ask the Microsoft server for the numbers again, in case they've changed. On this one, they're all the same. So they all got updated at the same time. So I guess 
because they answers all five questions, when they ask the Microsoft server, they'll all get refreshed at the same time. I guess okay. that's why. But I'm just making that up. I haven't really tested it. Yeah. So anyway, fast fluxing. Um, yeah, okay, TTL would be set to just a few seconds. You saw there the Microsoft was a thousand seconds or something. It's probably set to one of the normal numbers like like 3600 or something, which is, what, I think 10 hours or something like that. Um, then that's the point. You make it small, then you will, it will, what will happen is you'll have more traffic at your real DNS server because people will keep having the cache expire. But when you update your DNS server, your updates will percolate quickly. So it's good if you move a lot. Yeah. Yeah, there's a subtle difference, which I don't really remember. There, um, we may get there. It's, it's not easy to remember the difference. I think I finally decided to kind of gloss over it and even in the questions because it's hard to remember the difference. I think I read the book and I felt like I had it and then I felt like I didn't have it. They're very much some, pretty much the same thing in practice, I think. So here's Configure. Configure would have these really short things like a cache time of 60 or 32 seconds. So you can see it's going to expire after one minute. And when it does, it'll come up with totally different addresses. This is really weird, not realistic at all. Nobody would have a server with three addresses and one minute later move to a totally different part of the world and another different part of the world. This is why OpenDNS has a project called the Umbrella Project. They're now owned by Cisco, where they monitor the entire DNS space. They provide DNS service for everybody for free, so they have a lot of data, and they look at that data for all these suspicious patterns of behavior, and they can identify bad actors even before they do anything bad or people are complaining about them. They can just tell from the pattern of your DNS that you're obviously a bad guy. You're not behaving like a real server. Yeah. They have to have computer programs doing that. They can't update that manually. Uh, that's right. That's right. And it's, and it's AI detecting it, too. AI is at every level these days. That's, that's detecting, but I'm saying to yeah. change uh, The bad guys have written a script to hop from one machine to another. Okay. Yeah. And, and I know Configure in particular, uh, that's how they, they took down Configure. Configure had a hardware random number generator that would create random domain names, a new one every day. And they were able to predict it and buy the domain names. Microsoft bought like all the domain names for the next week, so they got control of the botnet. And that's one, one thing you can do. Anyway, um, what's funny is that that's illegal, right? Here now they're controlling a bunch of victim machines. So they had to actually get a special court order granting them the right to take control of all those infected machines. And people are still arguing about this because how can a U.S. court give you the right to take over machines outside the U.S.? Because you don't know who you're getting. It's worldwide. How does anybody have the authority to allow that? This is, there was also a search warrant. The FBI did this. First Anonymous did it illegally. And a year later, the FBI decided to catch the pedophiles behind Tor. So they took a pedophile porn site on Tor and they hacked it through Tor. Now, even if you can't find the server, if it has a vulnerability, you can send traffic and take it over. So they hacked the server and they changed the server to put up a fake update. Next time people came to the porn page, it would say, you have to update your software. And the update had malware in it, which would then send traffic directly to the FBI so they could find out who you are. And now they have now installed malware on a bunch of machines and they don't even know who they are or where they are. So how can you get a court order that authorizes that? Because whatever court does not have jurisdiction over this unknown area, but somehow they did that. And I think they had trouble in court justifying this data acquisition. This, a lot of modern crime really is hard to punish because the stuff you have to do is hard to explain to the judge in court about how you really had the right to do what you did. <laughs> It's tough. This is why, you know, people like the NSA just break the law. I mean, what are you going to do? You got to get this stuff. Uh, they just do it illegally in practice, and then you try to cover it up. And most typically, cable companies and the phone company cooperate. AT&T, after 9-11, they just handed the raw internet and telephony data straight to the government with no court order or anything, absolutely illegally. They've been doing it all along. They did it. And 10 years later, it leaked out, and Congress passed a bill retroactively forgiving them, saying we will not punish them for violation of the law. This is, this is the reality. The British are more comfortable with this than Americans. Americans tend to be idealists and say everyone should obey the law. The British say there's, of course, a secret agency that is breaking the law, and we understand that, and we support that, and that's, that's how it has to be. Um, anyway, here's fast flux. You can detect it here by seeing uh, the same domain is resolved to all these different addresses quickly. And then there are phantom domains um, where you register a domain and use it just for a brief period of time. Um, and uh, 
then move to another. Uh, this is a common trick where you use a free, so, well, there used to be a lot of domain registrars that would give you like a three day free trial. And of course the bad guys figured this out. Great, make a free trial, set a script to make a new free trial every day and I get free service forever. <laughs> and uh, of course now they have to up their game to just getting a stolen credit card to pretend to pay for it, which will bounce later. But again, you get some period of time, that's called float in check kiting, where you pay for something and you exploit the time it takes for them to find out that you didn't really pay for it. Uh, this is a trick people used to do. They call it check kiting, where you pay the bill with a check, it bounces, then you pay that with another check, which will also bounce, then you pay that with another check, which will also bounce, and on you go. <laughs> Until you run out of accounts, you can have something without ever really paying for it. <laughs> anyway, um, so that's the game here. Find domains that have been active recently, and this is one thing I heard them do a lot at the Umbrella Project. They notice new domains that appear and then more domains appear. They can tell from the pattern of this that you're a bad guy running a botnet and not a real company coming up and then serving a website that expects to have customers using it for a while. WannaCry was a big one. This was in May 2017. Uh, it was ransomware that would encrypt your files and it um, attacked, it took the shadow broker's data. So the Russian military, uh, first a CIA, an NSA contractor, the NSA had their own version of Metasploit called Fuzzbunch, which was a top secret attack tool used to hack our enemies and they had deployment servers they put it on and somebody at the NSA goofed and they put it on a machine that had Kaspersky antivirus installed. And Kaspersky identified it as malware and sent it back to Kaspersky in Russia. And the Russians stole it from Kaspersky or Kaspersky gave it to the Russians. They're currently in the front. They are, and they're also fairly close to the military. And, but they're saying, we didn't give it to them, they stole it from us, which is entirely possible because now we know the NSA totally steals it from American companies. So whether it's exactly their fault or not, they got all of the American spy tools and then the Russians paid somebody to pretend to be a Estonian and leak it and pretend, and he'll use the name Guccifer, but it was a Russian military agent. So they embarrassed the NSA by leaking out the tools. So this meant there were extremely powerful brand new attack tools available for everyone to use. Like everyone else, I downloaded and wrote projects, started hacking into things, it was bloody awesome. They really work. Um, that people talk about eternal blue, I found eternal romance to be better, but you, you can totally hack any machine that was not patched at this point. But Microsoft found out about a month in advance, and there were patches for most of it. So if you'd actually been putting on your updates, you'd be relatively safe. But a lot of people didn't, especially hospitals. And so it, they made this worm based on those stolen American exploits. And um, it wiped out a lot of people in Britain. It affected the National Health Service in Britain. And it would have shut down hospitals in America, but except for the time zone. When it hit Britain, it was a different part of the clock. Uh, Britain had their working day earlier. So it shut down hospitals, hit the news, and uh, this uh, researcher found it, and he found a, he downloaded a copy of the malware, and he just ran strings on it and saw a domain name. And he looked and said, nobody owns that domain name. So he just bought it. He said, what the hell? And what he didn't know was that domain name being active turned off the malware. I don't know why they wrote it that way. That was the off switch. So he turned off the attack tool before it hit America, and therefore undoubtedly saved a lot of American lives because it fouled up hospitals, and that was pretty cool, but he was then arrested by the US government uh, as he tried to go back to Britain from DEF CON, accusing him of previous crimes, and he's still trapped in America. He can't work, and he can't defend himself very well against the charges, and people are donating to his fund, and for a year he's been like sort of trapped in America, wandering around. Um, Marcus Hutchins is his name, and see, he's a hero because he saved us from WannaCry, but supposedly years ago he did something bad like run a botnet, and they're accusing him of that, or I think what he did was he wrote a remote control tool, which was used by malware, and they're trying to say he wrote it intentionally to sell the bad guys, and he says it was a good thing, and bad guys stole it. And but he's got to have his day in court and a lawyer and everything, but they won't let him leave the country or work. So he's kind of in a bad place waiting for all this legal stuff to resolve. Oh, because he's a foreigner, right? He doesn't have the right visa. So he, well, I, I, he support, he's, he became a celebrity. And so people are so donating to him, like the EFF and stuff. This is part of why it's a good idea to support the EFF. The EFF is like the SCLU for the internet. They are there to handle these ridiculous injustices that happen, and the internet is full of them because it creates these strange situations that the authority figures don't really know how to handle. So often, stupid, wrong things happen. <laughs> anyway, um, so here's the domain. This is Configure, making 50,000 new domains a day with this. They look random, but they're not. You could take the malware and predict them. 
And so Microsoft was able to buy them and take them over. Yeah. Hardware? No. Yeah. No, this was this was uh, using Shadowbird. This is software taking yeah, over Windows machines. Hardware random number generator. Oh no. If it was using a hardware random number generator, it would really be random. This is just right. simulated. Yeah, yeah. So you can just, and it's not, deliberately not random, of course, because they have to be able to predict it at the other end. It's like that Google Authenticator. They are not random. You can predict them at the other end. Right. That's how it knows when you got it. Yeah, pseudo random. All right, and then there's another big attack is just to change your DNS server. If I can infect you and change your DNS server to point instead of to whatever it normally points to, like 8.8.8.8, to a server I control, then I can just tell you any lies I want to and redirect your traffic anywhere I want to forever. This is DNS changer is one of the big malwares that did this. And what happens is you infect the machines, you can tell from the traffic that they are infected and you control them, but you don't have to attack right away. You can just let your attack spread for months and run a DNS server that hands out the right addresses so that everybody thinks it's fine. They don't know they're infected. Then you decide, I'm going to redirect all the Bank of America to a fake Bank of America page and steal the passwords, and it'll totally work, except for HTTPS. HTTPS will detect that I don't have a real Bank of America site, and your browser will pop up a warning message, but almost everybody just closes those and keeps going because they don't know what they mean. And if I am an advanced hacker, like a nation state, I probably have the ability to steal a valid HTTPS certificate or forge one. Um, so sometimes that even works. And China has done this several times. They put themselves in the middle with BGP updates, and they have the ability to sign traffic. That's why browsers now have another layer of defense on HTTPS. So even if you have a trusted registrar signing Google, it will tell you, wait a minute, Google is supposed to be signed in America, and today Google is signed in China. That's not legit. And that's, that's the modern improvement over HTTPS, extra checks. Anyway, um, so DNS changer, you can detect it. You will see recursive DNS resolvers going to a strange address. This is part of why a properly sanitary network would not let people use random cloud DNS servers like 8.8.8.8 .8 .8 .8 .8 and 208.8.67. You would have an official DNS server you want them to use, and you won't let them use anything else. You want to make sure they're using your official thing, just like the State Department wanted to make sure everybody like Hillary is using the official email server because then we can secure it to our standards and log it and monitor it and all that jazz. Now, when she was in there, they weren't really doing that. They were just sort of incompetent. There were no rules, so she made her own server. But in general, that is a poor practice. You don't let people run their own servers. You force them to use your official server so you control it and you can make sure it meets your security standards. Anyway. What's that? What's that? Well, oh, that so that was her issue. Email. Well, that's true. That was her issue. And she ended up mixing personal and work email on the same server. And that's another unsanitary thing you shouldn't do. You should have a personal email account. And then your company data should be on the company email account so that they can report it to regulation authorities and check it and all that jazz. You know, that would be better. That's why, in retrospect, she should have had two phones, one for the company and one for uh, home. Really have two different no, like uh, government in the as the first lady, none of this applied. It applied because she was Secretary of State. Okay, there you go. Yeah, being the first lady, there's none of this stuff. Yeah. And now a similar issue in the news today: Trump, government. Trump is refusing to give up his iPhone, and he's using an unsecured iPhone, and they can know everyone's intercepting it, reading the traffic, and so they're mad at him. Except they say it doesn't really matter because Trump doesn't read the security briefing, so he doesn't actually know any classified data anyway. And you know, yeah, you know, and this, this all started, you know, Obama, Obama was the first president to use instant messaging. He had a BlackBerry and he loved it. And when he became president, they said, you have to give up your BlackBerry and we'll give you a special, more secure BlackBerry, which is what he used. But he was, until then, presidents never used email or any of that stuff because it's not safe enough. You get an email, you don't really know who it came from. No, I was wondering if Obama is still part of something. Uh, I don't think so, but I haven't looked. Probably not. Probably not. Anyway, so um, anyway, you can see your DNS changer. You'll see it going to strange uh, I means. And then, of course, there's there's tunneling. We've talked about this. If you have a VPN, that's a tunnel, so all your traffic is now hidden from devices. It's, and, and you can also tunnel through port 53, and this is commonly done. You can sneak data out of a network in fake DNS requests, and the network will let the DNS requests out, and you put long random characters in the, in the DNS names, and that is encrypted data leaving the network. But it'll pass through all your security devices because it looks like legitimate requests. That's a common trick. 
So you, one way you can spot it is by just looking at the size of DNS requests. DNS requests are typically quite small. Give me the address for yahoo.com. It gives you an IP44 address. It doesn't fill the packet. But when people are doing tunneling, the packets are all very large. So that's a pretty easy way to spot that something weird is going on. It has these long domain names uh, that are not normally used. Yeah, usually DNS is little. Yes, exactly. If you were smarter, you would configure your tunnel to break it into smaller chunks. Exactly. Yes, this is. You can do this right from the headers. How big is the packet? Yeah, very easy. Yep. And so, um, and that's of course what you do. I mean, you always use the simplest procedure possible. When the Al Qassam Cyber Army attacked the American banks to punish them for a video about Muhammad, they had 14 rounds of attacks, each more sophisticated. And the first few were very simple. They would just send you a HTTP request with like 300 capital A's in the tether. So it was very easy to spot and block. And they were obviously pretty new to this. And with every generation, they improved their attacks and defenders had to improve their defenses. Anyway, then there's DOS attacks. You can, of course, freeze the DNS server itself by just flooding it with any type of messed up traffic. Um, so you can detect unexpected different than usual number of bits coming in or out, requests, and so on. Uh, you can use any protocol, ICMP, UDP, uh, any TCP, any of these have their advantages. Um, and enough of these, any kind of traffic, enough of it will fill the wire and freeze up, make your server useless. So uh, you can spot it with any of those uh, log measures. So we got another set of cahoots. I, I saw you use those A's before. Is that common practice? What's that? They're using the A's to, oh, no. the A's to have no, A's just, the memory. A's just the standard. So People use the first thing I had done as a 15 year old yeah. before seeing yeah. anybody. I'm just wondering if you. Really it, it's very that. common. I mean, I'm actually getting a hat with 41, 41, 41, 41 on it. You use it because then you can easily spot it in hex. Because you know A is 41 in hex. Uh, maybe the small case. I was using no, up, uppercase is 41 in hex. It's 65 in decimal uh, and 41, oh, in, 41 hex. in hex. Yeah, and so you use it, and then you can easily spot where it got. I didn't know. Yeah, yeah. It's, this is this is that's why it's classic. Yeah, yeah. And when you when you see forty one, you know you you're winning because the traffic you put in hit that memory location. Candy computer used hex when it showed you the dump of what on the memory. Almost everything does dump in hex. If you dump in base 10, the lines are all ragged because you have these stupid three-digit numbers. Hex is much cleaner for big amounts of data. That's why Wireshark does it. Anything trying to represent binary data typically puts it in hex. Hex is the most, okay. is the most efficient way to present binary data to humans. Yeah. Yes. And that's assembly. Yeah. That's right, yeah. That's right. That could, and the assembler is just for humans to see, to make it easier to read. The, the computer works only with the raw binary. I got another good face there. Face with a ponytail. APL? Yeah, I'm not sure about it. I remember APL. Yeah, I... It's like cobalt. It will never die, and the number of people that can maintain it is ever shrinking. Anyway, I'll uh, wait another few seconds. Yeah, yeah. And there's a whole bunch of infrastructure still using these really old languages, and you can't learn it in any school anywhere. Anyway, yeah. All right, so DNS poisoning. What kind of data do you send? So replies are what poisons it. You get It asks some other server for the data, and you send in a fake reply with the wrong data. That's poisoning. All right, and if you dig, A, evil.com, but you get four IPs, what's going on? Uh, 
That's right. That's normal behavior. That's round robin. Microsoft does that. That is not an attack or anything. That's just load balancing. That's what you do if you're a big company and you want to stay up. If one of those servers is busy or down, you want people to use the other. All right. That's not suspicious. All right. But if the TTL is always below 61, what does that indicate? My gosh, I can't remember it myself. We're going to have now. This is apparently past flux. What now? The question has come up. Let me see if I can figure it out. At one point, I understood this. Now, at one point, I understood this. Let's see if I can get it straight. Past flux is TDL with a few seconds. So, what is transient? Transient is small TTL, but I'm not getting the difference. Okay, well, change over hours or days, you're right. It's not seconds, but yeah, hours or days. Okay. Okay, I guess you're right. Okay, good. Well, there is a difference. Faster than transient. And transient is days. Right. Right. So transient is the old, see, you know, there used to be a statement, you know, if you change your DNS, you're, they say it might take hours for this to propagate. So that's why the old system couldn't change so fast. But then the network got much faster, and now you can really update in a few seconds. So it used to be that any TTL less than maybe a day is just stupid because it takes a long time to update anyway. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, you're right. A computer, yeah. Yeah, a script of some sort. Yeah, so it's that's good. Fast, yeah, fast flux is faster. Okay, good. Thank you. All right. And so which one of these gives you a covert channel? That's tunneling. A covert channel means you can send data without anyone knowing you're sending data. And that's what tunneling does. You send data inside some other packets like ICMP or DNS, where people think they know what it is, but they're actually a second kind of data being sent there that's not obvious. This is what you have to do to exfiltrate secrets from a company. Somehow sneak it out so it will look like some other kind of stuff. And of course, you've got the, you, you mentioned taking data out from DNS, but is that yeah. considered tunneling? Um, it is a covert channel, and you could call it tunneling, yeah. Okay. It's not necessarily encrypted, although it usually is. You can also do it in HTTP requests or ICMP, really anything. It's, it's, it's called tunneling because it's data in the wrong kind of packet. Like if you're sending ICMP, but it's actually moving some non-ICMP data. So they call that tunnel. And I guess there are small programs that they put on the drive to help you with that. Oh, tons of them. The original one was Loki. This was maybe 20 years ago. This was a common hacker trick. You would install Loki, and then you could send your data through ICMP, and then you would get free service at pay hotspots. Because even though they would block HTTP and DNS, they let ping through. So you just send your data through ping. You know, that's the kind of thing. And of course, the same thing applies for sneaking data out of a network or sneaking command and control traffic into the network. Yeah. Anyway, and what did Marcus Hutch do? To stop on a cry. That's one way to look at it. I didn't, but but um, we'll talk. That's part of these. These remind me to cover things. That's called sinkholing when you buy a domain to get rid of the traffic going to that domain. So he bought the domain, and now the traffic was going to an unexpected place and no longer under control of the bad guy. They call that sinkhole. You take some traffic and remove it so it no longer does what it was supposed to do. Anyway, so M dot and Rich, and I bet that is the same face again. Same. Okay, good. All right. So let me uh, make a note. Stephen has run twice, and I got M dot and Rich. All right, so those are the winners. Let me just take a look at the projects and see if I should say anything about them. You folks have done four and five now. Source port randomization, you should have seen in dynamic updates. You're down to the last official project, which is setting up the log. In accordance to what we said today, you'll just configure your bind server to log things. And then you should check out the extra credit projects, like I say, in the world of the future. I think um, this one here, DNS over HTTPS, is going to be very important. In my opinion, this should be the default on Windows and everything. It is a sin and a shame that DNS sends unencrypted traffic about everything you do to everybody around you. That is ridiculous. I don't know why we're putting up with it. 
and neither does anybody else, and they finally acted. And this is, I think, the real contender. If, if I had my druthers, this would be in the next Windows update. Everybody just used DNS or HTTPS as the default so that it would protect their privacy. But yeah, it shows you how to do it. And unfortunately, right now, it's not really ready for prime time. You have to add special software to your machine, core DNS, which is, you know, and it doesn't work all that well, and only on certain systems and all that jazz. It, it should just be built into Windows. And for some reason, it's been a long time coming. For 20 years, people have wanted this, and nobody ever gets builds it in like they ought to. But I think now privacy concerns are getting bigger and bigger. And I think now there's maybe a market to motivate people into building this into the commercial software we all use. Well, it will it will make network monitoring more difficult, that's for sure. Um, I don't know. That's, 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 that's a very good question. Won't change anything. I'm not aware of people. See, right now, it is like, um, well, yeah, but see, the point is, this is like people tell me, I don't use online banking, so I'm safe. Well, the fact is, your online banking is not how they steal it. They hack into the bank server and steal it all. So this is like, you, you've blocked a hole. You, you've blocked like a hole in the wall for the mouse, but the door is open. So you haven't really done much good. And that's the thing. The DNS is exposing your secrets, but that's not the main problem. The main problem is you just put them on Facebook. And people take so it's um, and if it's not that, everybody hacks everything, put it in open Amazon buckets and stuff like that. So it, maybe it won't really make a difference. So I think it's a mathematical purist like me that says, why did it send this data unencrypted when it should be encrypted? But in fact, in terms of a real threat model, it's probably not the main threat, and that's why nobody's bothered fixing it. But I'm glad you bring it up. This is a huge problem with security. Security experts always say, you should fix this thing. But the executives say, well, which one is actually costing me money? That thing is not really costing me money today, so I really don't care. And you say, but it's wrong, it's wrong. I say, yeah, sure, shut up. I, this, what matters is the things that are actually hurting us. <laughs> yeah. You said bring anybody who says that they have a secure system to you. Then we found the reason I haven't given the credit card to Samsung yeah. uh, is that um, I think my brother, who is in security, and my boss both had their thumbs with the credit card there. And the only two choices seem to be Google or Apple. Or they are because Google Pay or and App, Google Wallet and Android Pay or, or Apple Pay or something like that. And substantially, if you have one of their thumbs. Right now, so now the Google Wallet used to be better. much less secure, but on a modern spine, it's not that bad. What I want to ask you then yeah. is how long until Samsung? or each of those other companies loses all of the data in one case? Well, that's a very good question. And, and, and the issue is, what if they get hacked and lose it all? Now, I know Apple Pay, Apple Pay, um, your credit card number is not on the phone at all. But No, but Apple, of course, has a server. It's in your account. And I think the same way through Google. So this is certainly the case. The, B, the shopping sites like Amazon and Apple have an enormous amount of financial data, and they have to protect it. And I think customers are justifiably skeptical about their ability to protect it. This is why one option is the Obama option. Obama said the government will handle all the passwords and you'll log in through the government for everything. This is one of his announcements. Everyone said, oh, are you out of your mind? This is like when Trump said, we're going to secure our election machines by partnering with the Russians. <laughs> like the, the president, I think, I think, well, nobody knows what to do. And our leaders are even more clueless than the average techie. That's the problem. So you have to do shopping. So somebody has your data. Yeah. How many companies uh, hold all that data in a server yeah. when they know that reasonably within a certain amount of time from now, all that data is going to go to the it's, Well, it's the same as it's always been. If you have a bunch of inventory or a bunch of money in the bank, you're at risk of theft. So you put up safeguards and you monitor the amount of loss and you balance this is why I say, this is the job of being a business executive. You have stuff to protect and you can't protect it completely. So you try to put in enough safeguards so you don't lose it too often and you can do your business. Okay, this is, yeah, this is what security is. Like, how do you know that no one's gonna like shoot you when you walk down the street? You don't, That's they could, good. but we have enough cops and laws and street lights and everything. So we keep that down to a level that we can tolerate and people are happy enough. And the, well, I know, but that's what you do. You know, you, you, you're not perfect. You have to accept. So the job of the executive is to, and the, the security officer is to balance this, to take all these threats and figure out which threats are worth stopping because they're really going to hurt us and we can afford to stop them. And you accept the others as the cost of doing business. And in practice, Amazon didn't lose all the cards and Google didn't lose all the cards, but Staples did and Target did. And that's, and you can get a reissue of your card and you can get credit monitoring and we're all just accepting this. It's 
we, the convenience of credit cards is large enough that we're accepting the amount of loss. We could all go back paying cash for everything and then muggers would steal the cash out of your pocket. That would be the new threat. So, you know, no matter what you do, you right. get old and die, but you can't win. You can, only, <laughs> you can only achieve a certain level of security and you just have to balance it to where it's good enough to get by. And we're pretty lucky in this country. Most of these risks are actually held down to an acceptable level. I've, people on the inside have told me that the total amount of credit card loss in America is one and a half of 1% of all the transactions. And that is what they call an acceptable level. And that's what we do. And I have to agree, that's pretty much acceptable. That's the total average loss. Anyway, I think I'm going to uh, shut this down and uh, go to the lab and help anybody that feels like working here. And I guess we won't meet again for a couple of weeks. Uh, the next meeting of this class is... November 14th. So I guess that's two or three weeks away. All right, I'm stopping the share. Oh, there's a chat message. Maybe I should see, wouldn't it be better to make some of the addresses static? Oh, yes, uh, it could be, yeah. You, but uh, then you might get caught. Someone might uh, detect you and shut you down. So yeah. there, are different, there are different systems. But typically a criminal can't really use any addresses static. And the good guys, you might, if you have Microsoft had four addresses, you might want to make one of them static. I'm not sure. Yeah. Other people's static address to do the crime so that when the cops came, they'd be coming to somebody else's house. Yes, that's a thought. Yeah, there, there are various ways you might have a use for it. Anyway, I'm shutting her down.